everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Imran Khan and I'm a cardiac surgeon. Uh, today we're going to talk about the surgical management of constrictor pericarditis. So we'll talk not only about the surgical management but also how the patient presents and how we diagnose it. Uh, remember this uh, particular talk is only for the surgeons so we will not touch a lot of details about the diagnostic modalities like uh, various echo parameters and CT or MRI findings. So we'll not go into uh, detail in those modalities. So we'll focus more uh, from a surgical point of view. All right. So um, constrictor pericarditis is, as the name indicates, uh, when the pericardium becomes inflamed, uh, with time it becomes thickened and fibrosed, and uh, um, uh, time is reached when it, it is finally uh, at a stage where it is constricting the heart and that's where uh, we say that there's constrictive pericarditis. Uh, so the pericardium normally uh, encases the heart uh, and the great vessels. So this, this is the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, uh, aorta, in all the four chambers of the heart. So if you look at the cross section of the pericardium, uh, so let's suppose this is the uh, cardiac chamber, this is the epicardium. Uh, so, pericardium has two parts, a, a parietal part and a visceral part, alright. So the parietal part again has two parts, okay, uh, an outer uh, parietal uh, which is the fibrous part and an inner serous part. So the parietal part has a fibrous part and a serous part. Now this serous part continues over the epicardium and in between uh, the parietal far part of the serous uh, parietal part uh, of the serous pericardium and the visceral part there is a space this pericardial space and it normally contains fluid now this is a small quantity of fluid it is being produced and reabsorbed on daily basis now what happens in constrictive pericarditis because of various reasons infection inflammation malignancies post radiation there is a inflammation in the pericardium this inflammation on a long standing basis leads to fibrosis and thickening in this pericardium so much so that both these layers they are stuck to each other they get plastered with time they become thickened and a time is reached when it actually starts constricting the heart and that's where we say that the patient has constrictive pericarditis. So what are the causes? Now the causes of constrictive pericarditis depends upon whether you are uh, uh, in, in the western uh, in a western environment or you are in Asia because the causes are different in these two particular uh, areas. In western countries most of the time uh, you will come across post-radiation pericarditis, uh, post-cardiac uh, surgery and of course the idiopathic uh, patients. Um, you will see a lot of patients who have idiopathic pericarditis. In, in, in Asia, especially in subcontinent, and I, I, I say especially subcontinent because subcontinent has a population of uh, more than one point let's say 5 billion people and because of a different disease pattern and different etiological factors the constrictive pericarditis is a different is a different entity there so most of the times in in subcontinent the cause of constrictive pericarditis is tuberculosis okay so how does the patient present so as as the, the, the name suggests, it's, it is constrictive pericarditis. So, the first chamber of the heart that is going to be constricted or um, it, it will not uh, be allowed to expand properly during diastole, the diastolic filling will be uh, restricted. So, of course, you will see signs of right heart failure. So, the patient may present with uh, weight loss, shortness of breath, of course. The patient presents with SITs, pedal edema, anything that goes with right heart failure can be a presentation in the patient. Uh, 
Interestingly, some patients will have one sign and not the, not the others. For example, some patient will present with only mild pedal edema but very, um, uh, very, um, uh, with, with a lot of ascites. And, and frequent ascites that requires taping on a frequent basis. So how do we diagnose these patients? Now these patients can be a diagnostic dilemma because there are other pathologies uh, that, that, can be that, that, may, that can be very difficult to be differentiated from constrictive pericarditis. So obviously when a patient comes to you with some signs symptoms of right heart failure and you, you will start looking for, for, for the heart. But if the patient comes with ascites, let's suppose, pedal edema, there are other organs that we have to uh, we have to rule out first. For example, the liver, the kidneys, the GI. And most of the times, uh, with the, the literature says that most of the times, when these patients are finally diagnosed to have constrictive pericarditis, there is already a lag period of about. 10 to 15 months before we actually know that the patient has constrictive pericarditis and this is why this is a diagnostic dilemma in some sometimes in some patients but generally uh, from a surgeon point of view what I can tell you uh, so you depend upon imaging and then the important from uh, from a cardiac point of view is of course echo and then if you suspect constrictive pericarditis it is important to get a right heart catheterization or a left heart catheterization and look at uh, to the, the pressure traces of the of both the chambers in fact all the chambers <clears throat> so uh, uh, you can see a thickened pericardium uh, on a CD scan and usually a three more than three to four millimeter of thickened pericardium is suggestive of constrictive pericarditis the same can be seen um, uh, in the MRI and also in the MRI, you can see the, 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 the interventricular uh, septal uh, discordance. Uh, we'll come to that later on. The next modality is echo. Uh, echo can give you an idea about the thickness of pericardium. Uh, can can give you an idea about uh, uh, um, increased mitral uh, inflow during expiration. Uh, where we come, we are welcome to this. How how the, there is an increase in flow during expiration, and there are so many other parameters. And as we said in the beginning of the uh, of the lecture, that we are not going to discuss those modalities in detail. So then you come to the right heart catheterization or the left the, the cardiac catheterization. So before understanding cardiac catheterization, you need to understand one basic concept. What happens in constrictor pericarditis? Let's suppose this is the thorax with the heart inside, covered by this thickened pericardium, it's the diaphragm. Now, what happens normally? There is a very there is variation of pressure inside the thorax, and this variation of pressure is transmitted through the pericardium into the cardiac chambers. All right, but if this pericardium is thickened and it is restricting the heart, this variation in the, in the, in the intrathoracic pressure does not get transmitted into the cardiac chamber. Now this has consequences. Okay, we'll discuss this now. Now let's start, start with the cardiac transition and start with the right atrium. So let's suppose this is a pressure tracing from the right atrium. So this is the A wave, the C wave with an X descent, the V wave and the Y descent. We will not go into the detail of uh, the pressure tracing. We all know A is for atrial systole, C is for the tricuspid valve closure when it bulges back into the right atrium, V is the, the filling and then the rapid emptying of the, 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 emptying of the uh, right atrium. What happens in constrictive pericarditis, because the right atrium is already constricted, there is rapid filling of the right atrium and this is apparent in the pressure tracing as a prominent a prominent y descent so that is the first sign that you have constrictive pattern over the right atrium okay so one is 
why do you think? Prominence, okay? The second is, uh, now what happens normally? In inspiration, you have a decrease in thoracic pressure, which draws more blood from the body into the heart, and you have an increased flow of blood into the right atrium, okay? The opposite happens in constrictive pericarditis. So normally there's an increased flow of blood in the, in, in, in the right atrium with the inspiration. That does not happen when there is, constrict, there is constriction. And this one is called Casmol small sign okay now move on to the right ventricle okay so the right, right ventricle what's going on in the right ventricle let's suppose this is a pressure pressing of the right ventricle okay with systole and diastole mm -hmm. normally there is systole and then there is normal diastole but in constrictive pericarditis, this diastole is restricted by the thickened pericardium. The, the, the right ventricle can expand to some extent, but not beyond that. And that is dictated by the thickened pericardium. So the, 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 the right ventricle cannot expand beyond that point. Okay. So because of that restriction, what happens? So you have... A rapid, rapid early filling so what what you get ultimately is what is called so what you get ultimately is called the square root sign now what does this mean there is rapid early filling of the right ventricle, there is, there is rapid filling of the right ventricle initially, but as the right ventricle is filling up, at one point, the filling is restricted by the thickened pericardium. So further filling of the chamber is plateau. Okay. So this, this dip and plateau looks like, looks like a square root sign. Huh? So we call this a square root sign. So this is one of the signs that you can see on cardiac catheterization and constrictive pericarditis. All right. This can also be seen in restrictive cardiomyopathy. So it's not particular to constrictive pericarditis. This can also be seen in other pathologies like restrictive cardiomyopathy. Okay. So the other one is uh, if you compare the LV and the RV. Hmm, so this is so this is the LV pressure tracing and the RV pressure tracing. Okay. Normally, of course, the systolic pressure in the LV will be more compared to the RV. What happens in constrictive pericarditis? There is undulation of these waves with different systolic and diastolic character, okay? So what happens if this is, uh, if this is during um, inspiration, mm -hmm. if this is during inspiration, this is during expiration, what is happening here? In inspiration, the systolic LV pressure falls at a lower place compared to in expiration. Why is this so? This is because again it comes down to the pressure dissociation of the intrathoracic pressure to the intrachamber uh, intracardiac pressure. What happens in inspiration? You have a decreased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Okay. You have decreased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure in inspiration because there is decreased intrathoracic pressure generally. But this decreased intrathoracic pressure is not transmitted to the LV. Okay, so the LV pressure remains comparatively high. Now, what do you have? You have increased pressure uh, in the pulmonary vasculature, but at, at high high pressure in the LV. 
So the LV is not getting enough blood that it should normally. Hmm? So you have a decrease, sort of decrease cardiac output in, in inspiration and this will be shown by the LV trace like this but the opposite happens in the RV all right now in, in expiration what happens now this is increased intrathoracic pressure which is pushing all the blood from the pulmonary vasculature into the LV hmm? now because of that you have a higher uh, output from the um, LV and you have a discordance of uh, of the systolic RV and systolic LV pressure. So this area is usually more than this area. And this again is a very sensitive sign for diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis. And while you see all these variations in expiration and inspiration and all these signs in the pressure tracing, you will also observe that there is equalization of diastolic pressures in all the chambers of the heart. So equalization within 5 mm of mercury in all the chambers of the heart is very sensitive and uh, it, it, it seldom occurs in uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy. In fact, this equalization is usually more than 5 mm, within more than 5 mm of mercury in restrictive cardiomyopathy. All right, so what do we do with it? Any patient who is diagnosed constrictive cardiomyopathy pericarditis is symptomatic. The only curative management is surgical management. All right, there is no medical treatment for this. You have to remove that constricting pericardium. You have to remove that thickened pericardium. So that comes, uh, that brings us to the surgical management of constrictive pericarditis. All right. So surgery. The first thing first, approach. So approach can be a median sternotomy or left anterior thoracotomy. And in many rare cases, some people have extended the left thoracotomy into the right side with an extended incision, but that's very rare. Usually we do pericardiectomy through median sternotomy or left anterior thoracotomy. Now, which one should be the procedure of, uh, should be the approach of choice? So most of the authors, uh, if you see the literature, they would agree that median sternotomy uh, provides the optimal exposure of all the cardiac chambers and median sternotomy, sternotomy should be done. Uh, the other one is left anterior thoracotomy. So left thoracotomy has been reported in the literature for uh, purulent pericarditis to avoid sternal infection, uh, particularly from, uh, uh, from, from the literature which is generated from the subcontinent uh, where tuberculosis is rampant, still rampant. People have done left anterior thoracotomy for purulent pericarditis to avoid infection of the sternum. So these are the main uh, two main approaches, median sternotomy and left anterior thoracotomy. And which one is used mostly? Median sternotomy, all right? So the next question is uh, about the use of cardiopulmonary bypass. Whether you do it off pump or you do it on pump. Now, you have to keep in mind that the goal is complete pericardiectomy. And for complete pericardiectomy, sometimes you have to mobilize the heart, especially on the left side. and that mobilization might lead to hemodynamic instability and that's where you have to use cardiopulmonary bypass. Secondly, there can be atrogenic injuries, inadvertent entry into the cardiac chamber that will also necessitate the use of cardiopulmonary bypass. And because of this, we should always start our pericardiectomy with freeing of the cannulation sites. So you free the aorta, you free the right atrium and now you are ready for cannulation of the patient in cases of emergency and cardiopulmonary bypass. Now you don't necessarily need to cannulate the patient at this point because you have to uh, heparinize the patient fully and because of full heparinization of course 
there can be a lot of bleeding while during pericardectomy and it increases the chances of uh, bleeding. So uh, we discussed the approach and the use of cardiopulmonary bypass. What next? So we have done a median stenotomy. We have uh, released the cannulation sites. We have removed the thickened pericardium from the cannulation sites. We are ready to go on bypass anytime if the patient needs. Now what? So pericardiectomy is a very long and slow process. It requires a lot of patience. So patience is the key for a complete pericardiectomy. Okay? It may take a long time, but you have to be very patient. Now the right side first or the left side first. Now, if you remove the pericardium from the right side first and the left side is still constricted, what happens? There can be a ballooning of the right ventricle, uh, dilatation of the right ventricle, you will, have, you will have an increase in pulmonary pressures, okay, and the heart can get unstable. Because of this, many people, many, many experienced people, they suggest that you should remove the pericardium from the left side first. Once you remove the uh, free the left ventricle, then come back to the right ventricle, okay. And it is also important for a complete pericardectomy to remove the pericardium from the diaphragmatic surface, inferior surface, and also the right ventricle, superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. All right. <clears throat> when you start pericardectomy, um, sometimes you lose the plane. And the important thing is that you should see the epicardial coronaries. Once you see the coronaries, you know that you are in the right plane. Because it happens sometimes that the pericardium is, although it is thickened, but it is in different layers. Okay. So if you remove one or two layers, you might think that you are in the plane now. But unless you have seen the epicardial vessels and the proper release of the myocardium, you should search for the proper plane. Okay. Because that's where the proper plane lies. Okay. So intraoperatively. Uh, once you uh, finish the procedure, uh, the patient may need inotropic support because most of the, these patients have been have constricted the myocardium for a long time and it takes some time for the myocardium to recover and during that period the myocardium does need inotropic support. So most of the, these patients, especially those with, uh, with the, with high levels of pulmonary uh, pressures, these patients will need inotropic support. And in the ICU also, these patients usually need inotropic support for quite some time. Now, what are the outcomes? The in-hospital mortality, as uh, uh, mentioned in the literature, and, and, and it is, as mentioned in, uh, uh, in sizable uh, reports from the major centers of the world, the high volume centers of the world, the in-hospital mortality is usually 8 to 15 percent. So it does carry a very high mortality. It carries more mortality than cabbage and simple valve procedures. It carries mortality of 8 to 15 percent even in high volume centers of the world. Uh, in the long run, how these patients fare? Uh, these major centers, they show that five-year survival is around uh, 70 to 80 percent and as you go further, 10-year survival is even less than 60 to 70 percent have been reported. But you have to keep in mind that this depends, that the outcome depends upon, especially the long-term outcome depends upon the etiology of constructive pericarditis. For example, you would not uh, expect somebody who had a malignant uh, pericarditis because of malignancy with the primary malignant process going on in the body you would not uh, expect these patients to live for a long time of course the best outcome is usually carried by idiopathic uh, pericarditis then uh, tuberculous pericarditis and uh, uh, post radiation and post cardiac surgery, post open heart surgery, pericarditis, constrictive pericarditis usually have the worst uh, outcome as malignant pericarditis.
So what are the predictors of uh, this bad outcome in the short term and in the long term? <clears throat> so in the short term, uh, so the literature says there's patients who have hyponatremia, patients who have ascites, those who present with hypoalbuminemia. Uh, These are the patients who will fare worse in the short term. Okay? In the long term, most of the authors have mentioned uh, uh, the preoperative NYHA class, those in uh, class 3 or class 4 dyspnea, um, and of course the etiology of the constrictive pericarditis. These are the predictors of poor outcome in the long run. So, j just want to add one thing about uh, uh, constrictive pericarditis. Sometimes there is a lot of calcification, and this calcification is, is extremely difficult to be uh, removed. Yeah, so the pericardium becomes very difficult in, in those cases. So if you cannot remove the calcification, what you do, you remove the pericardium around that island of calcification and you leave it um, an island as such. So this is how you manage uh, calcified pericardium. So uh, uh, today's talk, we spoke about constrictive pericarditis, and this is by no means an exhaustive lecture about this important pathology. Uh, but I hope I have been able to give you some basic concepts uh, around the surgical management of constrictive pericarditis. So just to recap the surgical part, the approach is mostly median sphenotomy. Cardiac pulmonary bypass only when we need another, uh, when we have to go for another cardiac procedure or if there is inadvertent cardiac injury uh, during pericardectomy, we have to use cardiac pulmonary bypass or uh, during mobilization of the heart, especially for the lateral left lateral side, uh, there is hemodynamic instability, you use cardiac pulmonary bypass, right? The extent of pericardectomy is always phrenic to phrenic and uh, superior vena cava to inferior vena cava, including the right atrium, in, including the diaphragmatic surface of the heart, you have to free all these areas because any pericardium lift um, in any of these areas will lead to future uh, constriction. And uh, we know from the literature that repeat procedure for pericardectomy carries a very high mortality and morbidity. So I hope I have been able to give you an idea about uh, constructive pericarditis and some basic concepts. If you have some questions, you can ask in the comment section and uh, stay tuned till the next lecture.